Hi, and welcome to today's PowerPoint, Soil Fertility, all about the nutrients and the fertility of soil. So soil fertility is basically defined as the type and amount of nutrients found in a soil sample at a given time. The main nutrients are required by plants, and they include nitrates, um, potassium, phosphates, calcium, and magnesium, with probably nitrates, phosphates, potassium are kind of the biggies, but those are the ones the plants need for growth and for some other purposes you'll see later in the PowerPoint. pH is an important factor when it comes to soil fertility. Again, you'll see that addressed in the PowerPoint. And lastly, um, soil fertility is often called a chemical property of soil as well as the pH. So we studied the physical properties of soil, for instance, porosity and permeability. Those are physical properties. But if you see the word chemical properties on the AP test, they're asking you about the nutrients and pH. Two key ideas around soil fertility, nutrient retention, so that ability to retain or hold on to nutrients. So how well does the soil hold on to nutrients? Leaching, basically whenever it rains or you irrigate a field, that water percolates, permeates the soil. And as it does so, it dissolves nutrients and minerals that are in the soil and carries them downward. That is leaching. So if you think about permeability, we talked about water moving through the soil, right? So as it moves through the soil, it's picking up nutrients, dissolving nutrients and carrying them, carrying them it down with the water. Now this is the world's greatest picture, but for instance, maybe you have some dead and decomposing leaves here. Maybe there's some animal poop. Maybe you've got um, a dead and decaying organism, more leaves. So as these things start to decompose by maybe bacteria or other decomposers of the environment, they break down the, the nutrients that were in those organisms and return them to the soil. So there's this top layer, it's called humus, not hummus, humus with one N. And this humus is dead and decomposing plants and animals probably more likely plants, but there could be some animals and animal waste in there. Well, every time it rains, get some rain going, every time it rains, or maybe you irrigate your crops, the rain starts to permeate the soil. And when it does so, it picks up these nutrients and it's gonna carry them down with it. Right? It carry those nutrients down with it. So that is called leaching, leaching. If the rain is able to carry away most of those nutrients and they all get deposited down here, well, the soil didn't retain the nutrients very well. Right? They were lost. However, if when it rains, most of the nutrients stay in the soil, they resisted leaching and it has a higher nutrient retention. So leaching is the carrying away of the nutrients by the water and how well the soil holds on to those nutrients is the nutrient retention or holding capacity. And it's important that soil can hold on to those nutrients so that the plant roots can get to them. So you think the roots maybe are only gonna extend, like if you got a plant here, the little roots might only you know, extend that far down. So if the, nutrients, um, if the nutrients get leached too deeply, like say here, the plants can no longer reach them. So you kind of want that balance, you do want your soil to be permeable, you want there to be air spaces in it. But if water percolates quickly and dissolves all the nutrients and carries them away rapidly, that could be a problem. So you want your soil to, to be able to hang on to some nutrients, have some nutrient holding capacity. All right, so I found this, it's called Chico Enterprise um, Record. It was, I think, from somewhere um, in Butte County, which is where Chico State is. And they said that soil texture affects the soil's ability to retain water and nutrients, right? So we already know that if you have more sand, it can't hold on to water very well. If you have more clay, it holds on to the water very tightly. So we know that soil texture affects water holding capacity, but it also affects um, the ability to hold on to nutrients. So usually soils with more clay or organic matter, and organic matter is those dead and dying, decaying leaves and um, maybe manure poop. But if you have a lot of clay or organic matter, it holds on to the nutrients more effectively than sandy soils. So clay is better holding on to nutrients than sandy soils. 
Um, sand does not hold on to nutrients very tightly. So as the water drains through the sandy soil, right, it's got high permeability, it tends to carry those nutrients away along with it. it carries them down so deep, the roots can't reach them. So that's leaching. It carries the nutrients out of the root zone and makes the nutrients unavailable to plants. Well, that's a problem. So clay attracts and holds nutrients in the soil, and thus fewer nutrients are lost when the water drains through the clay soil. It drains so slowly, it really can't pull them down very readily. And then we'll talk about clay has some features that help it hold on to nutrients. So there's this balance as always. You want clay because clay can hold on to nutrients, but if you have too much clay, remember your uh, soil becomes waterlogged. Remember that? Or when it dries, it can become very hard. So again, there's always a balance. You want sand because that provides you with open pore spaces that makes your soil permeable so it doesn't get waterlogged. But if you have too much sand, well, then the nutrients just get carried away. So you want a little bit of clay to hold on to those nutrients. So it's always a balancing act. And if the soil does have too much sand, or on the opposite, too much clay, you can add organic matter. Um, again, organic matter are dead leaves, um, animal, animal poop. That organic matter does improve water and nutrient holding capacity. It's kind of spongy, and it adds some air spaces, but it also kind of hangs on to water a little bit, and it would add the nutrients that plants need, and it sometimes has the ability to hold on to nutrients. So you can, it's called amend the soil, you can add things to it. Um, I guess if you had too much clay, you could potentially add a little sand. If you had sand, add a little clay. But if you add organic matter, it also adds nutrients that plants need. So that's an extra plus. I put this here so you could see one of the reasons clay is so good at holding on to nutrients is not just water moves through it very slowly, so the water can't carry the nutrients away very rapidly, but clay does have on its surface a negative charge. You can kind of see it. I'll zoom in here. Right here, there's a negative charge kind of all along, oops, uh, all along the surface of the clay. Ignore my other line there. Um, and a lot of nutrients have a positive charge. So remember, opposites attract. Right, so it's right here, opposites attract. It's not good if this circle stuck. Maybe, maybe I'll get better. Um, but anyway, clay particles tend to carry a negative charge on their surface, so they attract and hold on to these positively charged nutrients. So they kind of hang on, they give that soil that nutrient holding capacity. Even if it rains, the water has a hard time like pulling that off. I did add this little picture here. If you remember from chemistry, that water, H2O, has a slightly negative end and slightly positive ends. Sometimes water will kind of grab onto these nutrients as well. And usually if the plant can absorb those, it can take on those nutrients too. But the main thing is clay is good at holding on to nutrients. So have a little clay in your soil can help its nutrient um, holding capacity. All right, pH. I'm like, what does pH have to do with nutrients? Seems kind of weird. Basically, I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but at different pHs, nutrients are more available. So at a pH of that neutral, right, kind of around seven, Nitrogen, it's a really important nutrient for plants to make proteins. Kind of between six and seven, phosphorus, important for DNA. Those nutrients are available in the soil. So if your soil, maybe I put a fertilizer with nitrogen and phosphorus on my soil. And if the pH is between six and seven, the phosphorus and nitrogen will be available. My plants will be able to take it up into their roots. Whereas if the pH is very acidic, maybe a four or a very basic like a 10, the nitrogen and phosphorus may have some issues, especially the nitrogen, if you look here. Um, sometimes they get kind of held up in the soil or locked into the soil at those different pHs. So pH can affect the availability of plants, like the availability of the nutrients in the soil and how well the plants can like get at it, I guess. Um, some metals actually become soluble or um, they kind of, get into the water and can be taken up by plants at very acidic pHs. And if you know or not, but metals can be toxic to plants. So that's a bad thing. So at different pHs, um, things can be locked in the soil or become more soluble, and that can be a problem for plants. So I summed it up, I think, a little better here. So 
So nutrient availability is primarily determined by soil texture. Like we said, it's got clay, it's gonna hold on to nutrients, mostly sand, it's not very good at holding on to nutrients, but also pH. So soil texture, right, is the sand, silt, and clay, organic matter, but pH, right, how acidic or alkaline or like basic something is. Oops. Um, so pH, right, is measured using the scale from zero to 14. You remember this from chemistry, right? Zero being acidic, seven is neutral, 14 is the most alkaline or kind of what we call basic sometimes. So most plants grow best at a pH of 5.5 to 7.5. Kind of depends on the plant, but in general, um, in this pH range, nutrients like nitrogen, like phosphorus, calcium, they're available. The roots can absorb them, right? So if you put that fertilizer on your soil and those nutrients are there, at those pH 5.5 to 7.5, the plants can take up those nutrients without much trouble. But at a higher pH, so more basic, or a lower pH, more acidic, some nutrients precipitate out. They can't be dissolved in water. I always say they kind of get locked into the soil and held onto by the soil. So roots can't get them. Kind of on the harmful end here, if the pH becomes very acidic, like I said, some metals will be released. And um, so the one I always think of is aluminum. So there's aluminum oxide in rocks. Ooh, again, that's so good at my circles. And it's held tightly in these rocks. But if the soil becomes very acidic, the aluminum is released from the rocks, it dissolves in water, and the roots take it up and it kills them. It's toxic for the roots. So pH does play a role, even though it's not a nutrient, it affects nutrient availability in the soil and whether plants can get nutrients or not. So again, it can be adjusted. If a pH of a soil is too acidic, you can add a base, something called limestone or lime. Kind of makes me think of um, baking soda. You can add kind of a calcium carbonate, right? Like a baking soda. <laughs> and um, that would adjust the pH, make it a little more basic, right? Just bring it up a little bit. So you can't amend the soil. So how do nutrients get into soil in the first place? You put your parent rock. So all soil comes from rock that's been weathered or broken down. So some rock naturally has phosphates in it, or phosphorus. So then that would end up in the soil. So sometimes the parent rock will already have nutrients. I don't know that often, but they can. I think probably the big one really is here, decomposing organic matter. So things die, plants, animals die, they poop, plant animals anyway. Um, that organic matter, when it's broken down, that has nutrients in it, nitrates, phosphates, calcium, things like that, that are then added back to the soil. That's probably the biggest, I would say, you know, um, help to the soil as far as nutrients go. Cycles. So cycling of matter, there is a nitrogen cycle and a phosphorus cycle that both cycle nutrients through soil. And then lastly, you could add fertilizer. So if your soil was lacking nutrients, we just can buy some fertilizer at the store and add it to your soil. So our focus, I'll talk a little bit about some cycles and a little bit about fertilizer. And that's it. All right, so I did want to put a little thing about the cycles. Um, sometimes they're called biogeochemical cycles. So bio meaning living, geo like rocks, earth, soil, and chemical, I think chemical reactions. And if you remember, it goes back to this law of conservation of matter, right? Matter cannot be created nor destroyed, All right? Matter can't be created nor destroyed, right? So all the matter that is here on Earth, all the atoms, the molecules that are here on Earth are just constantly rearranged into different um, molecules. So all the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, it's all here on Earth, just gets rearranged into different molecules. And so the matter is never created nor destroyed, it's just rearranged. It kind of states that here. Right? The matter in an ecosystem changes from one form to another as it moves through like the non-living, through the soil and the water to the living things like the plants and animals and then back and when things decompose. It's just being changed from one form to another, but it's all still the same. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, it's still all the same. We call these the nutrient or biogeochemical cycles. Starting with the nitrogen, this seems to be 
maybe the most important one when it comes to plants and what I've seen on the AP exam. And I'm going to start here. I'm going to start here. So plants and animals, we need nitrogen. We need it to make proteins. We need it to make DNA. Without those things, we don't exist. The problem is most of the nitrogen uh, on Earth is in the atmosphere. And we have no way to get that in. We can't breathe it in through our lungs. Trees can't take it in. We have like no way to get at it. So it's there, but it's not, we can't get it. But we need it. So luckily there's this cycle. If you follow this path here, there's bacteria. And this bacteria actually lives in the roots of plants. I have a little picture on the next slide. Um, plants like alfalfa, clover, um, chickpeas, they're called legumes. And these bacteria live in the roots of these legumes. And the bacteria get a nice home to live in, right? And the bacteria, I should say the bacteria get a nice home to live in. And uh, the legumes get the nitrates they need. I didn't mess that up. So the bacteria get a nice home to live in. The legumes get the nitrates they need. So these bacteria living in the, the roots of the plants, they take in the nitrogen from the atmosphere, they take in the nitrogen from the atmosphere, and they're able to convert it. And they convert it into something called ammonia or ammonium. And that's in the soil. Now well, that's in the soil. So the bacteria in the roots of the plants convert it to ammonia and ammonium, and now that's in the soil. But plants still don't really like that. That's not something they're going to readily take up. So luckily, there's more bacteria in the soil. And this bacteria living in the soil takes in the ammonia and ammonium and it changes it to something called nitrates. Plants are still like, eh, not my favorite, not real soluble in water, and it's not liking it. So luckily, there's more bacteria in the soil. And that bacteria converts it to nitrates, NO3. And plants are like, yes, finally. It's in a form that is soluble in water. That means it'll get into the water and plants can take it up in their roots. Plants like it. So plants take up the nitrates and they assimilate it. That just means they use it to build proteins, they use it to build DNA, they assimilate it into their body. It becomes a part of the plant. And that's a good thing for animals because animals can eat plants in the food chain, right? They eat them, and then they can get the nitrates they need. So they break down the proteins in the plants and they rebuild them into their tissue, into the food chain. So that's the basic nitrogen cycle. There is a little couple additional things here. Um, you might say, well, why is this a cycle? Well, there are some bacteria in the soil that change the nitrates back into atmospheric nitrogen. I guess that would make it a cycle, a loop. Um, there's also another step here when plants, really when plants and animals die or plants pee and animals die, decomposers will break them down. And usually it's this ammonia first and then the bacteria will continue the process. So the nitrogen cycle, so one of those things, you just gotta remember it. I don't know if there's an easy, an easy way to do that. You just gotta look at it a few times. There may be some videos online. I didn't find anything great, but I know on um, Bozeman there's some things. These are some key words. Source. Sources of the nitrogen. We've got a source, or sometimes it's called a reservoir of nitrogen in the air. Um, a sink is like what it goes into. So I guess the bacteria could be a sink, like the nitrogen in the air is a source or a reservoir, and it sinks into this bacteria that take it on. Sometimes those are words I've seen on the AP test. So source is where is it coming from, a sink, it goes into it, and a reservoir is like a bank of it or like a store of it. I just said put one of these up. These are those plants. So this could be like an alfalfa. I put some here, chickpea, clover, and it's got these nodules on its roots. And inside, that's where the bacteria live. And these bacteria get a cozy home and the plants get nitrates for them that they can use. I call them, I think the bacteria is rhizobium and the plants are called legumes. All right. 
So why is this nitrogen cycle important? It's necessary for proteins. Maybe I'll get this line figured out someday. Um, DNA and RNA. Um, it's usually in really short supply. There's usually not enough nitrates in the soil. So it's often why this cycle is important or to have plants that are legumes adding it to your soil. Um, it cannot be directly used by organisms. So said, nitrogen is in the atmosphere, but we can't get it. So we got to get it fixed by these bacteria, then plants can take it and then animals can eat the plants. Without that process, we would not be able to make the proteins we need because we couldn't get the nitrogen we needed. So. All right, the only other cycle kind of tied into the soil fertility is the phosphorus cycle. Plants need phosphorus to grow. They mainly need it to make DNA. They need it for some processes that go on in the cells. And phosphorus really comes from rocks. So you've got some rock here, right? Maybe a volcanic eruption or some, uh, what they call parent rock, right? Maybe it's been here even millions of years. And this rock over time gets pushed up Plates moving, right? It gets pushed up into like a exposed area, maybe a little mountain top. And the rain constantly hits it. Wind constantly hits it. Right? Rain hits it. Wind blows on it. Plant roots grow in it. And it starts to break the rock into smaller pieces, maybe even into soil. So now when it rains, right, that rainwater is going to carry those phosphates into the soil, into the soil. And so now plant roots can take them up, right? Animals can eat the plants, they get it. Sometimes phosphates will wash into water, which is not a bad thing um, if it's in limited amounts. Um, algae can use those for growth. So basically you need phosphates to make DNA and some other processes. Um, comes from the original parent rock that has phosphates in it from when it formed way, way back when. It gets lifted up. Weathering and erosion breaks it down. It ends up in soil and the plant roots can take it up from the soil. Animals eat the plants. And there you go. Um, again, when plants and animals die or animals poop, it gets broken down by decomposers and phosphates get added back into the soil. Little cycle. So this one, the source is mainly rocks. You could also say a source is dead and decomposing plants and animals, but the source are really, the, I guess, the reservoir, rocks. So the nitrogen cycle, the reservoir is the atmosphere. Here it's rocks. The source, you could say rocks. I guess the source could also be the soil. And the sinks are where it ends up in. So it ends up in plants, it ends up in animals. Again, you just kind of got to look at it a few times, get it stuck in your head, I guess. So why is the phosphorus cycle important? Is that phosphorus is needed for DNA, fat, cell membranes. Um, actually, I, I did say bones, teeth, shells. So it's an important component to a lot of living things. Um, I did put it's a slow cycle. It depends on the breakdown and weathering of rocks. That's very slow. Um, so it's often limited in soil and water, and algae need it in water. But because it's such a slow cycle, it's usually limited amounts. So often farmers need to add this in the form of a fertilizer. Um, and remember, it's based in rocks, not in the atmosphere. So nitrogen, found in the atmosphere, phosphorus in rocks. All right, so the last thing, what if your soil doesn't have what you need, or you're a farmer and you're constantly using the, the nutrients in your soil? Maybe the cycle, the phosphorus cycle is too slow. You need to add some fertilizer to your soil. So I put this here. When we're farming, think about this. You grow the tomatoes, but eventually you're going to harvest those tomatoes. Think all of the nitrates and the phosphates in the soil, they got taken up by the plant. And the plant uses them to build their proteins, their DNA inside the, the plant. Well, then what do we do? We cut that plant down and we take it away. So now we've removed all of the nutrients from the soil. So if you're doing that on a regular basis, every year you're doing that, 
they're constantly depleting the soil. So we have to add it back. And we can add it back in the form of what's called inorganic fertilizer, fertilizer that's made um, in a lab or is mined, or you can do some composting. You could take dead and decomposing plants, or you could use animal poop. And that's called organic fertilizer, but soil has to be replenished. So I put this here, whoops. Um, so organic fertilizer is from plants and animals, basically manure is poop. Maybe you have um, some leftover food, you let worms eat it, you let leaves decompose, that's organic. It came from living things. There's also inorganic fertilizer. That's the type you usually buy, say at Target, um, or a farmer would buy. It's been mined from the rocks in Earth's crust or synthesized in factories. And that's usually what you buy if you buy a bag of fertilizer. Not this is that great of a picture, but hey, we have got organic fertilizer, right? Cow poop, or if the cow dies and decomposes, probably pretty gross, wouldn't do that, but maybe cow poop or some dead plants. Or you could buy fertilizer that's been made in the lab, that's been mined from rocks. I call that mineral fertilizer. All right, the benefits of fertilizer, uh, it can give a quick boost. Like if your soil is depleted, it's like, boom, quick, you buy it, you add it, it's there. So a really quick boost to your, your plants and their growth, it's usually easily dissolved, reaches the crop cells quickly. It can really boost your production, which is a goal. Um, organic fertilizers, again, those are the ones from decaying leaves, from animal poop. Um, those are usually better in terms of holding on to water, um, more of a slow release, more of a slow release. Whereas chemical fertilizers that maybe you buy from, um, say like I said, Target, chemical fertilizers that have been made in the lab or mined, they're nice because they're very predictable. You know exactly how much you added and you know when you add it. So you know exactly how much nitrates are actually in a chemical fertilizer. When you buy it, it tells you what percent of the fertilizer is nitrates or potassium or phosphorus. They're, they're very reliable that way. There are obviously some drawbacks. Um, the nitrates and phosphates can run off. So it can rain, pick up those nutrients and carry them into water. Um, nitrates and water can cause some issues. Um, I know with cardiovascular problems, um, sometimes they can even get into the wind and get into the air and cause some um, respiratory problems. But the big one is nitrates and phosphates stimulate plants to grow. So if they get into a river, they stimulate the algae to grow. And you get an overgrowth of algae, which is a whole chain reaction of events that we will talk about at a future date. Um, also, if you use too much fertilizer, if you've ever done this, I know I have, you can actually burn the plants. You can burn their roots. Um, so a buildup of fertilizers can be, can be damaging and, and affect your crop roots. Um, they can also be expensive. If you're using a lot of chemical fertilizers, you get through this treadmill and they can be expensive. Sorry about my typos. I need to fix that. My apologies. All right. Well, last but not least, Google AP Environmental Science Bozeman. Um, I'll link a couple more videos I've um, into my playlist for Soil Basics. But check him out. He does an amazing job reviewing all of these topics. Maybe a little less mumbly than me. Um, if you can find it or find it on a streaming service, I had a little trouble finding it. I just have it on DVD, but. The History Channel has a series called Modern Marvels, and there is a fertilizer episode that's excellent. If you're able to find that, check it out. And then lastly, there, someone had asked, we had an assignment called Soil Basics Study Tool. Well, at this point, I can't collect this assignment. I'm not able to see you guys. We're on lockdown, right? So don't worry about completing it. Do not worry about completing this assignment. However, it is nice to look it over it's got some pages in the book that you would want um, to look at because you're still responsible for that material on maybe the AP exam. So I put it here, the pages are noted. So I'm not worried, don't worry about completing this assignment. I have no way to collect it from you, but it does have the pages here if you wanted to read them over. So these are terms and things you'll need to know. If you remember, I had the, the two cards. So don't necessarily worry about completing these, just make sure you know that information. And have a great weekend, and thanks for watching.